And um, let's let's go on to uh, another Shayan triumph, if uh, if we if we can. Um, this model is going to be provocative, um, and uh, hopefully this will soon be translated into into uh, uh, full publication. Um, but the ideas here are radical in their implications and, and far-reaching. And I think this is actually, um, it, it has great import um, across areas. And um, uh, I, I'm going to comment on it a little bit ahead of time um, to sort of set the stage. There are many types of health conditions um, where um, there are kind of classes of related conditions that depend on certain common factors. Perhaps it's, it's factors related to, um, um, to some amount of uh, of sort of mental health, um, uh, underlying mental health uh, distress, um, as it might manifest in in a couple of different different forms, in, in um, suicidal ideation, in self harm, and self medication, uh, substance use. Um, think trauma, for example, and in, in a you know tra trauma informed care is a point of considerable considerable significance um, uh, right now within health delivery for reasons that trauma has this wide reaching impact on, um, on health behaviors and health conditions across multiple areas. Um, obesity is, an, is another area that has you know, ramifications in, in, in diverse particular chronic diseases um, you know, with the damage done by hypertension and, and diabetes, but also heart disease and, and, and even things like cancer and vulnerabilities to COVID-19, et cetera. Um, in other cases, there's risk factors that, um, that uh, we don't know exactly, but they manifest in many conditions. Um, you know, uh, sexual, uh, you know, high-risk sexual behavior may come out in gonorrhea, it may come out in chlamydia, it may come out in HPV, it may come out in, in um, you, you know, probably in, it may be in different communities, but, but in syphilis and, um, and uh, those, are, those are all driven by, you know, some, some common, common risk behaviors. Um, risk behaviors associated with substance use uh, manifest in many particular ways. Um, with overdose deaths, to be sure, um, but they may also manifest in domestic violence, uh, for example. Um, uh, may manifest in um, in uh, you know myocarditis or 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 um, uh, infections of the heart due to injection drug use, um, uh, and and so you know there are these whole areas of health uh, where multiple important conditions that are often considered in isolation are affected by common, common underlying risk factors or protective factors or pre-existing conditions that are themselves perhaps under-evidenced. And when I say under-evidenced, I mean, there's not, there's not nearly as good under, not nearly as good measurement of trauma as there should be. During the pandemic, there hasn't been as good measurement and quantification of, you know, mental health distress and depression and anxiety as there should be. Um, but we know it manifests in all these different faces. This talk is about, provides an example, and I, I prefer to think of it as an exemplar of a technique that is designed to, to tap in to that phenomena of common cause. And to do so, 
in a way that's true to this principle of system science of the whole being some of the different from the sum of the parts. So we're going to examine here two different conditions, measles and chickenpox, which are driven by some similar contact patterns, similar types of contact patterns. Both of these are airborne diseases. And as such, they are both influenced by, driven by to a certain degree, governed by contact patterns that can lead to spread of, of airborne infections, right? Um, and as such, data on measles and data on chickenpox over time tells us something about those contact patterns. If we're listening with the right type of, of, of ear, we can hear what that's telling us about the contact patterns for each of them in isolation. Measles is telling us something about contact rates over time, surely. And, and how those are different. Uh, obviously, it's affected by other things like buildup of susceptibles, kids who haven't got measles, but it's also affected by contact patterns, how they change seasonally, for example, when kids are in school or not. In chickenpox, it's the same thing, but it's the same contact patterns, you know, the same types of contact patterns that can lead to airborne transmission of one and the other. So each of them are telling us about a common thing. And the idea here is can we listen to both of them together? in a way would jointly illuminate this in a way that would benefit both of them. That's, that's the core idea. Um, okay, so, so you know, quantifying mixing patterns or contact patterns is a key part of mathematical epidemiology. And, and um, contact matrices are a way we, we contact, we, we capture that traditionally in, in, in this area. Um, and of course there's been, a lot of work done in, um, in seeking in recent decades to try to qu um, quantify contact patterns. Um, and uh, there's the whole polymod study, um, studies uh, such as we've run using, using mobile sensing technologies or smartphones to recognize changes in contact patterns over time. Um, but um, we know that uh, contact patterns often change. And, you know, in the context of a pandemic, when we have pandemic restrictions and, and um, you know, um, public health advisories encouraging social distancing or public health orders that, that, that mandate social distancing and that, that, that ask for, you know, limiting gatherings to no more than you know, 20 in size or what have you, that contact patterns change. And we know that they change in the context of course of a year, even seasonally, um, as, as kids go to school and holidays occur and mixing for holidays and, and et cetera. Um, so the idea here was to estimate contact matrices dynamically through particle filtering. Um, but to do so with, with the lenses of two different pathogens, measles and chickenpox. And the idea is that, well, there might be some slight differences in measles and chickenpox. It might be slightly longer you know, distances, uh, for example, the, over which measles can transmit, with both of them being aerosol transmitted. Um, surely you're picking up um, signal about the same types of contact patterns with both of them. Um, and if we could use both of them simultaneously to, ex to, to estimate this contact matrix in parallel, um, we might get better resolution of what that contact matrix is, who's mixing with whom and how much. In other words, we'll have more data that we can bring to the table at the least, right? Well, chicken box data, we'll have measles data. And all of that will illuminate over time how that, how that, how that, um, um, that contact matrix is evolving. Um, and by so doing, we can then use that contact matrix to better anticipate how measles will evolve and chicken pox will evolve. In other words, doing them together will yield benefits for both of them. 
because doing doing measles together with chickenpox estimate it'll have it'll arrive at a better estimate of the contact matrix is the hope than it would if it had used measles data alone and by so doing maybe that will allow measles to be projected forward understand the risk of of um of outbreaks more um, and I should give credit to my student, Lujia Duan, recently hired by Google, who uh, did the first chickenpox model, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, um, Cheyenne specialized in, um, in uh, measles and pertussis, but hadn't, hadn't focused on chickenpox. Okay, um, so, so we had data on um, monthly reports of chicken box and measles in the pre-vaccination era for 20 some odd 40 uh, mumble 20 some odd years i think um a couple of decades i think it was it was more than 20 it was more than 20 years yeah um uh, uh and uh and what what we did was to to build particle filtering models here um uh we had a particle filtering model of of uh, measles and another one of chicken pox. These are shown as sort of the structure of the of the model itself. And if it looks similarly, similar structure, it's because they're quite well characterized by similar structure. Um, you have um, susceptible, expected, uh, exposed, infected, and recovered regime. We're not dealing for chicken pox. You know, we've done quite a lot of modeling of chicken pox um, with. Uh, ABMs and, and have cost effectiveness studies on it with, with ABMs, but we're not getting into uh, things like uh, like uh, shingles also caused by varicella zoster virus here. We're just, just uh, confining ourselves to sort of acute chicken pox. Um, and uh, so we have these two models for chicken pox and measles and they both make use of a common contact matrix. Um, um, and um, uh, and so, um, by virtue of being used in a common contract matrix, um, um, we're going to be able to estimate using measles data, this contact matrix, and sharpen it with chicken pox, and each of them will benefit from that, you know, especially sharpened um, matrix. Now, um, within this model, there's going to be this kind of classic um, uh, progression here. Um, there's going to be uh, age structure um, associated with this, and there's going to be a uh, reporting rate um, that's captured by, by these here, which is going to differ between the two. Um, so um, the reporting rate for, um, for chickenpox will be different from, from measles. Um, and I won't go into all the details of it, but we have a set of evolving this remember much of the goal of, of of particle filtering is to keep our models humble to be open to data pointing to other other realities um uh to leave them open to being corrected as it were um to be included in to trends they didn't expect and and in order to achieve that we have evolving parameters and and we had a couple evolving parameters here um uh, some of those evolving parameters had to do with uh, contact rate. Um, some had to do with uh, the elements of the mixing matrix. And uh, I should know this, but um, MA, uh, is, I can't remember uh, offhand what, what that is. Cheyenne, could you remind me, MA? Uh, I think it should be the fraction. Um, so 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 that there, there is a parameter which is the infectious uh, contact rate mm -hmm. uh, the, the, oh, okay. uh, the adults fraction related to the uh, children yeah. age group to yeah, make so, those two yeah yeah so it's basically the relative transmissibility among adults versus kids or something like that yes. reflecting yeah. the fact that there's um uh, children and adults uh, exhibit Differing hygienic behaviors um, that can lead to different likelihoods of transmission um, given a contact. Um, um, yeah. Um, so, 
Uh, I would note that there was also some stochastics, like with some of uh, uh, some of our other models uh, on this incidence transmission. So when people get infected, it is on average given by a certain classic equation, but um, can vary around stochastically from that. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, so these these measles system dynamics model and, and chickenpox system dynamics model um, shared in common a common contact matrix. Uh, and um, there was this random walk occurring on this, uh, this beta that reflected sort of the, the degree of contact as it might you know, change over the course of the seasons or because of social distancing due to some known existing outbreak of either of them, et cetera. And the idea was that, that this was shared in common. That's the key idea, the contact matrix. And we're seeking each of these together with the data to shed light on this contract matrix, to illuminate it. So Cheyenne ran this model with in, in three different broad ways. One is with, with just the measles model, particle filtering to measles data. And you saw this yesterday, and it is a thing of beauty. Um, you know, of the model sort of matching the crenulations of these, um, uh, of these, um, um, of, of the uh, movements of, of these patterns. And, and note that, um, Shayan, maybe you could um, help, help remind me here, because you have both black and and red dots here. Um, can you remind me the the black versus the red here? I, I'm have, um, having trouble sorry, remembering. Sorry, yeah, I can't remember very clearly. No, um, uh, it may um, have been monthly. Oh, maybe it's monthly versus yearly or something. Uh, no, um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Maybe it's adults versus children, or I'm not sure. Anyway, um, mumble. Um, that, uh, yeah, we should find out what, what that is, right? Um, here's adults and, 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 and kids. Um, uh, you could see it, you know, we have these, um, these uncertainty bands, certainly. I mean, the, this is the high probability density region of the model. So remember, remember uh, one of these particle filter models has a distribution of possible states. It doesn't put all its eggs in a basket of one state. It, it, it considers many hypotheses and they have different pedigrees as indicated by their, by their weights. Something with a high weight is much more frequent than one with a low weight. And, and that induces you know, some number of, 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 of uh, infectives that are occurring per month, for example, in that model, uh, a distribution over that, that we can quantify. So some particles posit a higher number, some a low, but as you can see, it, it pretty well matches these observations from the kids. This is this is um, um, kids for yearly data and for adults. It's not perfect, but it matches pretty well. In short, it's it's kind of nailing, you know, the the state of this model, right? It's it's like it's figuring out how many how many kids are infected, and how many adults are infected, and it's being regrounded against this and it's tracking it very well as to like where the burden of infection is. There are some years where it's kind of off, but, but it, by and large, it's, it's doing very well. Note that this is a year where, um, if, interestingly, it, it matched quite well uh, kids, but it didn't match so well adults. Um, and of course, it's doing this because it's estimating the underlying state of the system, right? It's, so this is um, uh, S E, sorry, S E I R, um, kind of S E I R, and that's matching, you know, the number of people in these these states here. Um, this is for kids, I think, and this is for adults. Um, so it's it's inferring the underlying state, and you can see that it's you can see. I mean, Cheyenne is the queen, and she makes these things sing, and you can see what a difference this is compared to that last presentation, um, which was pre show yet. Um, you know, um, and and you know this this obviously it's quite localized. 
but it's performing very well. So it's got that right balance of requisite, you know, flexibility, but also, um, you know, really uh, capturing very well those, those dynamics. Um, it's not so uncertain. It doesn't know what's going to happen going forward, nor is it um, uh, overly, um, overly, you know, cocksure of its interpretation, bullheaded in a way it can't match it. It can match it very well. Um, so uh, here we have the sort of underlying burden of infection. What these are are portraits, of course, of what's going on in each of these states, right? It's how many people over time are in this state or this state or that state. And the reason, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the reason it's kind of fuzzy is because some particles think it's more, some think it's less, right? That's why there's sort of a breadth here. Some particles think it's as high as the number of kids um, who are susceptible to measles as high as, I don't know, 80,000. And some think it's as low as 40,000. Um, so some think, you know, kids susceptible to measles are, are higher, some think it's lower. But we're kind of plotting that out. You can see it's pretty well contained and they seem to pretty well agree when it, the infectives are high and the exposed are high, et cetera. And you can see all these are linked, right? Like when one of these shoots up at time about 50, this, um, the number of susceptible drop because kids are being infected. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it will lead to the particles evolving. There. Um, okay, so those are measles. Um, now these are results for, for measles for contacts per day. So remember, a lot of the goal here is to estimate this contact matrix. So what we've been looking at is kind of the SCIR structure, but now let's focus in on the contact matrix. And I, I wanna come back to this slide later because it will bear on, on the implications of taking them together versus in isolation. This is only measles by itself. Maybe for some who have worked in a biology lab, this will remind you of ELISA's in, in Western blots or something like that. But um, you know, this is for the contact matrix estimates of you know this beta over time. Um, uh, this this quantity here over time, and this uh, this MA, which is rep representing the kind of relative infectiousness among adults. You know, because they don't take a lollipop from one kid and stick it in their own mouth or something, unless they're the, the parent. Um, so, um, so here, you know, it's getting a reading of the relative transmissibility of, of uh, you know, this, this bug among adults compared to kids. And you'll notice early on, this is, a, this is an important lesson at, at a practical level here, um, uh, uh, that, for the first, you know, four years or so, right? This is fifty months. Um, uh, it's and it actually looks like a little bit more than four years, probably. You know, it's more uncertain. It hasn't, it hasn't really gotten a, a clear read on the situation. It's not sure about its read on the situation. It's a little bit blur. It's a little bit sort of confused about its situation. Um, and, and, then, um, and then after a while, it kind of gets the hang of it, uh, gets a knack for what's going on, and it's reading it increasingly confidently. And it kind of snaps into an interpretation that's not, it, it's not suppressing dissent. I mean, there's other, other interpretations that are being considered, but by and large, there's a kind of consensus that look, adults are a lot less transmissible. They, they have to be to explain the data. It's sort of interpreting the data. And at some point it's, oh, come on. The, the evidence is so clear here that in order to, to explain these patterns we've seen, given the logic of the situation as captured by these models, the only way we're gonna make sense of this consistently is that adults are less transmissible than kids. And so we have a MA, a, a, um, uh, sorry, an MA here, sort of a ratio of transmissibility between adults and kids of less than less than one. And it's kind of wandering up towards 0.5. I, I don't know what's going on here. Maybe there's a lot of lollipops being shared or something. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's getting, 
it, it has a pretty clear uh, consensus. Um, now, these are other aspects of it. This is for, I think, uh, uh, child and these are adults. Um, uh, this is uh, for, for like the fraction of, okay, this is maybe kids um, who have contact with, with kids, 20% of their overall contacts or with, with other kids or something, something along those lines and the fraction of adults or with adults. Notice it's, it's really kind of uncertain about this, um, uh, about this interpretation. It's very diffuse. This is a sign that it's not quite sure. Notice early on, it, it was like totally clueless. And then it, it kind of got its, its epiphany and it sort of zeroed in in here with kids, but it's still not sure with adults. It's all over the map. Um, okay, so this was measles. Um, it's kind of getting a picture. These are distributions, remember. We actually have a distribution of our states, particles, distributions of our states, you know, different hypotheses, what was going on, but they induce distributions over these things like the fraction of kid contacts or the, with, uh, with other, other kids uh, mumble. It's actually this times, times beta C. So it's a little bit, um, it's not maybe quite that, uh, anyway, I'm not gonna, not gonna say. There's a fraction of kids with kids, fraction of kids with adults, et cetera. Um, so let's look at chicken pox. Chicken pox, I think uh, Lugier originally worked on this and he did a good job and then Cheyenne picked it up. Um, uh, and uh, I think she had guided a, a little bit him on this before. And here's chicken pox only. And I'm, I guess uh, Cheyenne, is this because chicken pox somehow only was recorded yearly after a certain date or something like yeah. that? Yeah, 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 we missed the data before um, the month three hundred. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but we had we had monthly data before that time. Is that right? Yes. Something yeah. Like that? Yeah. Just not yearly data. Okay. In other words, remember it was yearly broken up by age. Um, the data, bef uh, the 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 monthly data was not broken up by age. Um, so. Uh, so you can't just turn this into an estimate for these earlier times because we it didn't have a breakdown by age, that's my recollection. Um, okay, so this is trying to pick up its understanding. And notice the 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 number of susceptibles here. It's 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 broader um, interpretation. It's not as not as tight as it was for measles. Maybe in part because we didn't have kids versus adults breakdown here. Um, and uh, here's uh, for recovered for kids, here's exposed and, and infected. And, um, and here for adults, it's kind of, kind of often, this should be in an uh, abstract art museum, I tell you. Um, uh, it looks a little bit like my hair on a bad day. Um, you know, this is uh, susceptible for adults um, and recovered adults and infectives. It's, it's really having trouble in large part, I think, because we don't have data on a monthly basis, susceptibles or adults. Um, so it's, it's quite, um, um, quite, quite broad in its characterization. Um, okay, so, so here's uh, for chickenpox alone. And you'll notice here, contacts per day for kids, it's kind of reading out and, and uh, this is the, uh, uh, effective contact rate multiplier. Um, Cheyenne, did we use, um, yeah, this is the same MA, right? Like MA is shared between the two models, but here we're only using chickenpox. So, um, but there won't be a separate MA for chickenpox versus measles. It's the same MA, right? Uh, yeah, same. Yeah, same, same. Um, yeah, so, so here for chickenpox data alone and reason about chickenpox, it, it really can't, draw a bead on this that well. It's not able to, to really pin this down very well. It's pretty uncertain. It's, it seems to be mostly confidence below one, but it's not, it's not even sure, sure of that at that point. Um, and then when it comes to this, you know, it's like out to lunch uh, by itself. Chicken pox data without these kid and adult breakdown for chicken pox, 
it's it's getting more confident once that breakdown is there, but it doesn't really converge in time. And so it's just kind of uncertain about, you know, what fraction of kids are with kids because it just doesn't have very good breakdown. Okay, now this is both. Okay. Oh, uh, this is this is like the greatest work, Xiao Xiao Yan. We um this is the greatest work. Okay, so so here. This is um, over time um, uh, data for measles uh, as the model matches it when we're simulating both together. So now we have both of them driving this contact matrix and interpreting the contact matrix. And you can see that it doesn't impair in any way the ability to match um, chickenpox data. Um, uh, sorry, measles data, measles data here. And it doesn't impair in any way the ability to match child and adults, adult um, chicken box data. Sorry, my US accent is coming through. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's matching the children and the adults um, uh, reasonably well for, for measles, even though it's a joint contact matrix, even though it's a consensus contact matrix. Um, this, this for chicken box. Um, and um, you know, here it's, it's able to match chickenpox very well, even though it's a consensus matrix, even though they both have to agree on this matrix, even though they're both making use of it, it allows for a matrix in terms of changing assumptions about contact rates and so on that just allow you to match the chickenpox data very, very well as well. Um, so measles and chickenpox are giving a very consistent picture in short for this for this matrix, you know, there's some differences for the adults uh, here um, uh, for uh, some discrepancy between what it expects and what it sees. And, you know, one interesting question is whether the ascertainment rate for adults might be lower because um, it, it might manifest with different symptoms in adults than compared to kids, for example. Um, but um, and they might be less likely to present for for care because you know of of the relative risks uh, for for adults chickenpox might be seen as kind of more of a of a nuisance um, and it, it might uh, well anyway I won't I won't go into it but um, uh, there might be um, you know immunity built up that lowers the severity of symptoms anyway um, here for measles and you can see here for measles um, and. If I had my druthers, um, I'm going to show you measles here. Take take a look at these. Get a load of these, okay? And you can see this is susceptible, exposed, infected, recover. I'm going to zip back to this using only measles data, okay? Um, to to earlier, this was our first um, measles before, and you can see these were wider. It had more uncertainty there. Why? because it wasn't also being informed by chickenpox data. Now it's being informed by chickenpox data as well. It's narrowing up these interpretations. It's making them more precise for measles because it is chickenpox data to help add to the, you know, add to its confidence about the, um, uh, about the, uh, the nature of that contact matrix, et cetera. Um, uh, so this was for children, um, and now for adults, you could see it's it's very sure. Like it has variety; it allows a wide variety of diversity of views. But there's pretty much a consensus for here, and I'll go compare it to the to the results for adults earlier for only measles, where it was you know more it had a bit bit wider of a of a characterization here. So, so that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, and, and here we see for, okay, now this, this is gonna be the one that's the real, the real kicker. So here for, chick, for chicken pox. Um, um, so uh, here's, here's the results for chicken pox. Remember earlier, if we, only had chickenpox data because we didn't have this breakdown adults and kids for 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 most of the time frame. Um, uh, we 
we had only a sort of limited resolution to know how many kids are currently susceptible, right? Um, uh, we had a somewhat better read on adults, but for kids, it was, it was pretty, pretty wide um, because we just didn't have the requisite data to give us. Now we have measles data coming into this as well, and that's sharpening our, our contact matrix. And it's, it's bringing this uncertainty to a close. It's really letting it zero in on a consistent interpret on a consistent interpretation that simultaneously explains the measles patterns and the chickenpox patterns, and better allows matching the chickenpox data. Right. Um, so here we're matching chickenpox data and kids, and look at how that's narrowed that. Right. Um, here's for for adults. Um, uh, and, and you may not remember this, but this was the bad hair day. You could see the, 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 the hair over here. Um, and I'm going to zip back just so you have a, you know, hair suit memory of that. There it is. There it stands before you in all its hair suit glory. Um, you know, this, this hairy mess, this hairball was the result because it couldn't get a read on the, uh, the adults excuse me, sorry, my US accent is too strong here. The adult side, um, uh, it, was, it was too uncertain because it didn't have good data on kids versus adults. Um, but, um, uh, but here it's able to do so, um, excuse me, here it's able to do so because it does have the chicken pox, uh, sorry, the measles data also informing the contact matrix it's able to get a better read on the contact matrix. Um, you, you may not remember this um, um, before, but uh, this is the read on the, the contact matrix. Um, when we only had chickenpox data, um, only chickenpox, uh, we, we were quite hopeless, you know, in terms of like this adult disease effectiveness, um, effective contact rate multiplier. And it was pretty fuzzy here, although it got better once we started getting the, the age specific breakdown. Um, um, but it was, you know, it was kind of fuzzy and it wasn't even sure it was below one um, for this uh, multiplier. And this one was just all over the map before. It just couldn't resolve it. It got better once we had the breakdowns, but it was too late for the adult fraction and the child fraction. Um, the, the sort of mixing children, children, or adult, adult. Um, okay, let's go, let's go look at what that looks like when we have both types of data, if we can't. Um, here we go. And you can see it's a world apart. I mean, this thing is just sure that it's less than one and it just zeroes down for this level of like 0.25, recognizing you know, that uh, adults have, have, have uh, less risk of transmission per contact. Um, uh, than kids. Um, and it's much more certain about what this contacts per day is. It's much more certain because it has both sources of data to draw on. They, they have illuminated a common cause that drives both of them. For, for this, for the child-child, um, uh, it's a world apart, right? I mean, before it was just it was embarrassing. It was like that. It was, it was, you know, out, out black spot, out, out black blot. Um, you know, we, we, we can pull it down to, um, to, to be much tighter. And so it is with this, uh, adult, adult um, uh, contact fraction. Um, so, um, uh, okay. I'm, I'm, um, uh, mumble. Oh, this is the, the ratio of, transmissibility of chicken pox compared to measles. And it reflects the fact that measles is uh, you know, exceptionally transmissible. Chicken pox is very transmissible, but not nearly the level of, 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 of measles. And so the, the ratio of their transmissibilities is, um, it, it, it's suggesting less than 0.5. It's around 0.39 here. Um, OK, so here we're estimating this infectious contract contact matrix. And what we find is that 
our ability to project chickenpox is materially enhanced um, uh, by having measles data. And even with measles, it seems its ability to, um, to match measles data is enhanced by having chickenpox data because they both share this common cause. Um, and you know, we're, we're grounding the whole states of this system with multiple pieces of empirical data that cut across these multiple conditions. I started off um, here, uh, this lecture, by saying that this is emblematic of a broader set of, of issues, isn't it? Um, it's emblematic of a vast number of these sort of clusters of health conditions that are driven by you know, some common risk factors or common protective factors, common early childhood experiences or what have you that manifest in many places. And it's, it's, a, real, um, uh, it's a real loss to our health system, to uh, our ability to, to research phenomena in the world that a lot of these factors that are most important, things like the existence of childhood trauma or adverse childhood experiences and the burden in terms of, of trauma, um, uh, factors that, that um, uh, come from uh, early stage life, which then manifest in multiple chronic diseases, um, uh, factors that, that govern multiple chronic diseases, but where we have less data on their dynamics, mental health, um, uh, burdens that 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 come out in different um, with different distressing manifestations in different mental health disorders or substance use challenges. Often we don't have the sort of good surveillance systems that we'd like to uh, for those. Um, and you know we could talk about big data and, and using smartphone-based data collection or using um, uh, social media and using search data and all that's excellent, but the fact is that if you have an upstream factor that is driving multiple downstream factors, um, and you can jointly particle filter for those multiple down those multiple conditions downstream, you can illuminate this hidden structure up, upstream, which is driving all of them, um, or which is helping to govern all of them, and by so doing you can sort of cast light on this aspect of latent state through multiple lines of data sets. And that can start to give you a clue as to, you know, uh, what may be going on in these other under evidenced areas of the system and these areas of the system, which, which are, are poorly measured, you know, in and of themselves. Um, uh, I think this has huge implications far away from, from communicable disease, but it obviously bears on communicable disease as well. Clearly you can't do this with any two conditions, right? We can't do it for measles and gonorrhea. They're not transmitted by the same types of contact patterns, but you could do it for chlamydia, gonorrhea and HPV um, transmitted by sexual contact. Um, uh, and you could do it for chicken pox, uh, measles and influenza, um, they're all airborne transmitted. Um, once it gets to droplet-based methods, you might do it for pertussis and, and a more droplet-based uh, transmitted uh, pathogen. But the general picture is clear here. The prospects are clear. The opportunity is clear um, that one can use data from multiple conditions driven by some sort of common governing mechanisms using systems data science techniques like particle filtering, we can shed light on those common um, conditions. And by so doing, we can actually get better guidance on any one of those conditions. Just like having measles data could let us better project chickenpox and having chickenpox data could somewhat improve our ability to to estimate the, the burden of measles to, to, better, um, uh, to better sort of capture that. So ladies and gentlemen, the opportunities here are great. And once again, this is just a triumph of, of, of Xiaoyan's um, contributions here that she's shed light um, on this data 
and we're looking forward to getting this uh, getting this fully into print. Um, okay, a question. When you combine the meanings, you simulated one multi-disease model. Yeah, great question. Yes, there was one multi-disease model to rule them all. Um, and um, uh, so there was one model running jointly with these things. So we had one particle filtering model. Uh, and um, in it, simultaneously, Rachel, we had uh, chickenpox stocks and flows. We had measles stocks and flows. We had them both making use of this contact matrix. And of course, them all being particle filtered at the same time. So it was a single model capturing, um, uh, capturing the evolution of these two systems. Now, I, I need to sharpen that a bit because um, it, we were not, and I want to emphasize this, we were not keeping track of the count of people in all combinations of things. It's not like we were saying, this is a person who's susceptible for chickenpox and currently infected with measles. We don't, we don't have, you know, um, we don't have to keep track of all combinations of possibilities, uh, co-infections or something. No, 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 no. Um, it's the same population represented um, here. We're not, we're not interested in who has chickenpox, but it's later stage measles, but earlier stage chickenpox. No, no, no. We're, we're not, we're not capturing that. It's the same population progressing through here separately with measles or chickenpox, but they're both sharing this contact matrix. Um, and by so doing, we're shedding, shedding light on this. One could imagine COVID-19 and influenza being of interest, but there you might also have interest in co-infection where someone's simultaneously affected because of risks of pneumonia being worse if you have both, um, in, you know, if you have chickenpox and you're superimposed with, uh, with influenza, you might get both. Um, so, you know, if we were to do this for self-harm and, and for suicide, or for depression and self-harm, for example, you would have a depression model, a self-harm model, um, and, and there might be some common factors involving um, you know, ideation in the population that drive both, that we're estimating with both. Hopefully that's helpful. How do we merge the models? Um, uh, are there interactions? No, th so those weren't, um, there were, there were, we did not capture interactions between the two. It's, you know, um, um, if, if we were to do so, you'd need a much larger state space. Um, you would need combinations of these. Um, you know, you'd need a, like, uh, for, for, for kids, we need a susceptible uh, for chickenpox and susceptible for, uh, for measles. We need susceptible for chickenpox for kids and and exposed for measles, susceptible for chickenpox for kids, and infected for measles. And uh, you know you can do it, but it would it would actually make it harder to infer because the state space of the model would be larger, and we don't have data on co-infection. If we had some sort of data on co-infection, um, uh, you know that would be uh, that would be helpful. Um, in the case of COVID-19 and influenza, we're, we do have models which are both together, not particle, uh, mumble. No, we do have particle filter. Nasteron, Nasteron is, has, has, has done particle filtering uh, with measles and, and, um, and influenza. Um, but um, there we, um, you know, there are some interesting phenomena with risk of, of, of um, influenza-based pneumonia maybe being worsened by you know, concurrent um, um, uh, COVID-19 infection or, or um, vaccination for influenza offering, the data would suggest some modest added protection for COVID-19, um, from COVID-19 infection. So, so there are some, you know, opportunities there um, uh, for, for shedding light on, on, uh, on that. Um, uh, it, it also bears noting that some wastewater sources um, right now in Canada, extant, are collecting data jointly for multiple conditions. So, for example, simultaneously samples are run for influenza and for, for COVID-19 by some of our collaborators in, um, 
uh, in Precision Labs in Alberta, um, the Prof Lab uh, in Alberta. So, so, so that's uh, possible. Um, uh, let's see, the potential for common upstream drive for inequities. I couldn't agree more. The, the, the structures in theory may be less mathematically explicit. That, that's, that, is, that is true. Um, uh, th this is absolutely true. And, um, uh, you know, there, there may be cases where there are, um, you know, a qualitative understanding of factors, again, involving um, uh, involving certain types of um, trauma, um, which does manifest in, in measles and where characterizing that trauma dynamically is, in, is important, um, uh, which might drive others. But I agree with you that, um, uh, that there are many cases where it's not so crisp. But I would say that there's also cases with mental health and addictions where you might get something like, um, you know, a latent state of uh, people with, uh, uh, with, with physical dependency on opioids or, or who, have, um, um, uh, who have high tolerance um, for opioids in the sense of um, their bodies can break it down more and, and you know, decay to low tolerance. You might be able to capture something, uh, something like that quite well. I agree, Alex, that there's, um, it seems to me that th this is more crisp in its characterization, first cut. But for me, what it does is this is useful as a first cut to explore this basic idea of you know, upstream factors driving both and being able to illuminate those by multiple lines of evidence downstream. Given that this is so promising, and it, and it really is, um, one thing we haven't talked here is predictive validity, how much it improved prediction, outbreak prediction, um, or you know, for, for measles or for chickenpox. But given how promising it is, I think it would bear you know, some significant thoughtful examination of could this be done for certain areas of mental health and addictions, for example, where because it is so under evidenced, you know, community-based burden of X, Y, or Z or something, um, you know, um, that that we could uh, uh, th that with some thoughtful approach to it, we could uh, still capture it. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, we might not even know the exact nature of that upstream factor as it's as it's dictated, but. Um, we might be able to find a plausible driving influence of it. I think it's promising enough. In short, it's probably worth some significant investigation, trialing things out, and and um, and exploration, you know, of this. Um, could this model be used for COVID restrictions, unintentional? And th this is much my interest. Um, so we do a lot of work at the intersection of um, so so Larisa, who's on here now, and Jenna. Neiser, uh, Jenna Mee, who's, um, who's with our group, but is currently on mat leave, is do, are doing wonderful work on mental health crises secondary to COVID-19, including um, uh, mental health burden, uh, homelessness, um, uh, substance use, uh, and, and, and greater vulnerability to COVID-19 transmission and the, the coupling of these. Um, uh, they're primary tool right now is an agent-based model, but something like this um, could be used. And in fact, Jalen McCulloch, who's also on the call, is, is doing some of that work with opioid modeling, um, uh, an area in which Narges is contributing a great deal too. And, uh, and there's a lot of possibilities here for doing something along these lines, I think, in that area that might shed light. Um, uh, on on those under evidenced uh, areas, Amelia Gillies is also um, contributing to that. Um, yeah, so I I think uh, I think there's there's possibilities here, um, and in a way, some of Alex's comments get to some of the material for this afternoon, which is, <clears throat> you know, um, infectious diseases is an area where there's some theory, 
And in other cases, we have theory because we have some knowledge of the structure of a care system and how people flow throughout it, for example. We know about the structure of the system. We know about structure through a lot of you know, study and communicable diseases. Um, uh, we know something about the structures associated with chronic diseases. But when it comes to mental health and, and its manifestations in the population, um, well, there are theories that give some ideas for, for structure. And, and while we can divide up you know, levels of suicidal ideation and progression among them in, in some basic ways, concrete versus non-concrete, et cetera, the, the sort of the physics of how that progresses or the, the staging of it isn't, isn't as well defined. And I think um, you know, some of these methods we'll be talking about this afternoon, which move beyond existing theory to try to find accounting which best matches the data, you know, can end up playing a role, a role there um, in coming uh, weeks and months. So anyway, um, kudos to Cheyenne for advancing this. I mean, this is, this is, I think, you know, phenomenal in its implications and, um, and its possible extensions to other areas are numerous. Okay, um, so uh, that was the uh, second case study.